Good afternoon to all of you in the room and those watching online. I'm Lex McCusker. I'm the Director of Student Entrepreneurship Programs at GW. I'm delighted to welcome you today to the second session in our exciting new speaker series at the George Washington School of Business called George Talks Business. Our goal is to bring you new conversations each week with a, with a interesting guest and to, on, on a wide range of timely topics. Our guest today is Dave Zilko. Dave is the CEO and chairman of uh, Fuel Leadership and the former vice chairman of Garden Fresh Gourmet. He's also a GW School of Business alum. Dave, thank you for taking time for joining us today. Pleasure to be here, thank you. Great. I'd like to jump right into the first question. Please give us some background on you. I'm, I'm, we're all curious about when and how you decided to become an entrepreneur, and we need to know, we want to know how you went about starting Garden Fresh. Beautiful. Uh, first of all, pleasure to be here. Uh, I did get my MBA here, two of the best years of my life. So to anyone who's associated with George Washington, congratulations on being associated with a very special place. Um, speak from my heart when I say that I, I love this place. So um, to answer your question, it, it really speaks to whether an entrepreneur is born or are they made. And in my case, I grew up in suburban Detroit, very humble beginnings, uh, five of us in an 1,100 square foot home, uh, greatest parents ever. Uh, we had what we needed, but not much more. Um, and I simply remember my mom sitting me down and with my brother and sister and saying, you can do whatever you want in this world, as long as you're determined enough to, to and set your mind to do it. Um, I seem to get that memo, they didn't. <laughs> so that message connected with me and from my various my very earliest memories, I remember being drawn to some form of entrepreneurialism. And my brother and my sister weren't, nothing against that. I, they've had very happy, probably more fulfilled lives than I have. But um, uh, for some reason, it connected with me. So um, I got a degree in finance from Michigan State, uh, came out here, got an MBA in marketing. Um, and when I returned home to Detroit, I started a specialty food company. I literally developed four marinades in my kitchen counter, came up with a name called American Connoisseur, uh, hired a graphic designer, $15 an hour, stood over her shoulder, and she generated one label each, laminated them, cut them out with scissors, and scotch taped them on the bottles I gave her. And I had the audacity to send them to the buyer at Dayton Hudson's Marshall Fields, now it's Macy's, and the guy calls me to home a week later, I certainly didn't have an office, and he goes, I gotta tell you, these are the best marinades I ever had, and he goes, I'm gonna place an order. So a week later, I got an order in the mail for 96 cases of my American Connoisseur Gourmet <laughs> Marinades. So that's the good news, bad news is I have no place to make these, I'm scrambling around. I find a little three inch square foot uh, uh, bay in an industrial park and the landlord tells me, um, you know, they've got a couple, a counter back there with a couple of things, why don't you convert this to a commercial food processing facility? So I did just that um, and I'm doing some research, I decided to do just that and I needed $2,500 to start making food here. Well, that was $2,500 more than I had at the time. So I did what every red-blooded American entrepreneur does. You want to start a business, you don't have any money. I applied for a credit card loan with Discover, who soon discovered two things about me. One, I had no income, and two, I had a lot of student loan debt. Um, so they turned me down. Yeah. So I did what every red-blooded American male entrepreneur does in your situation like this. Uh, I went to my girlfriend, and <laughs> she must have seen something in me, and so she signed for that first credit card loan. Well. And uh, people ask all the time, I did marry her, we're still married today, two beautiful kids. And uh, uh, she says the best investment she ever made, but more than that a little later. So anyway, um, I'm struggling in this kitchen. We were fine in the summer, we had air conditioning, but in the winter we had no heat. And I would call my landlord who'd live in the Bahamas for tax purposes and say, look, the heat's not coming on, just flick the switch, flick the switch, it'll come on, it never came on. Five Michigan winters, it never came on. Uh, I didn't have a forklift either. Anytime somebody would come pick up product, I had to wheel it out by hand and put it on a truck myself. Uh, trucks wouldn't even come in. Um, it was taking them an hour to get in and out of the place. And um, I ended up buying a mustard company across the parking lot, A, because their little facility had heat, and B, she had a forklift. Mm -hmm. so, so I made my first 400,000 bottles of marinade in this little kitchen. Um, I made the uh, first 800,000 bottles of mustard across the parking lot. And fast forward 11 years, what I refer to as my lost decade, um, $350,000 in debt that I'll admit to. I'm just glad my then girlfriend, now wife, doesn't read what I gave her to sign. You know, why should, no sense both of us losing sleep at night. And um, I'm technically bankrupt, and I make my way to a food show in New York at the Javits Center. 
and I meet a man named Jack Aronson, six foot five, two hundred seventy-five pound, world champion softball player, um, who uh, was also operating a food company in Detroit called Garden Fresh Gourmet. So we get back to Detroit after this food show, and he's we're having lunch, and he's telling me about his saga. A couple years beforehand, he was bankrupt. I was technically bankrupt. He literally had to declare bankruptcy to haul down his lease in a 1,200 square foot restaurant just outside of Detroit. He's taken the bus to work because his car got repossessed. Literally, out of desperation to try to pay his electric bill, he pulls out a five gallon bucket. And in 15 minutes, his very first shot, 15 minutes peeling onions by hand, he makes what is today garden fresh artichoke garlic salsa. So, um, uh, he had just moved out of the uh, restaurant and he got talked into building a plant and he's telling me he overbuilt. He couldn't pay his rent. He's going, he's going bankrupt again. So he said, why don't you um, uh, outsource your manufacturing to me, move in with me, take your GW MBA, focus on sales, marketing, do whatever you want. So I did. A few months after, after doing so, our ta talents seemed to complement each other. So he asked me to become a partner. So we were on our way. So uh, we brought in a professional creative designer. Um, no more looking over somebody's mm. shoulder for 15 minutes anymore. We really got our branding right, and we were kind of on our way. So uh, the first year we did $4.6 million together, still losing money. I didn't take a salary from the company for 18 months I was there. Uh, and our goal was to get the company to $10 million in revenue. Well, before we knew it, uh, we became the number one brand of fresh salsa in the United States. Uh, we bought a hummus company. We eventually overtook Kraft as the third largest hummus manufacturer in this country. Uh, we bought a tortilla chip company in Grand Rapids. We were the number one brand of chips merchandising the deli. We are the ninth leading brand of dips. We did the deal with Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville Food Group, mm -hmm. licensed a deli line under his brand. And again, our goal is to get the company to $10 million in sales. We eventually got it to $110 million in sales. Wow. Oh, and I got, in, I got invited to speak at an investment banking conference uh, at the Marriott Marquis in New York. And um, uh, the guy who came after me happened to be the vice president of mergers and acquisitions for the Campbell Soup Company. And he and I were on a panel after that. And then we were talking, and he called me about a month later. And he asked if we were for sale, and mm -hmm. I told him we weren't. We had been approached mm -hmm. by many Fortune 500 food companies. And he said, you know, look, just keep it in mind. And next time you're in Southern California, go talk to some guys running a company called Bolt House Farms. We just bought them. Mm -hmm. So to show you how motivated I was, I waited five months. Uh, before I went out there, I thought it'd be a five minute meet and greet. Mm -hmm. I really connected with them. It turned out to be 125 minute meet and greet. And fast forward to June of 2015, and we had a pretty spectacular exit. We sold to the Campbell Soup Company for almost a quarter billion dollars. We'll come back to Campbell Soup. I want to talk, let, 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 let's dig in on irrational persistence. Beautiful. Beautiful. So you've written a book with that clever title. You start with a quote from Calvin Coolidge. Mm -hmm. Calvin Coolidge is my second favorite president. Uh. Let me, I want to read it to the, to the audience. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence, determination alone are, are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Tell us, Dave, what is irrational persistence? Well, if you think about it, the stats are very public and all over the place. Uh, something like 95 out of every 100 new businesses fail. Maybe 90 out of every 100 new businesses fail. So by definition, to start a company uh, when you've got a 5 to 10% success rate is not an irrational thing to do. It doesn't make sense. In fact, it's irrational. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so, to, to, again, to even start a company is, is irrational. And then you need to persist. So I talked to you about my lost decade, you know, uh, 11 years in an unheated 300 square foot little commissary in Detroit making 400,000 bottles of marinade, uh, uh, making 800,000 uh, jars of mustard by hand, running up $350,000 in debt. And then I meet Jack Aronson, who had a couple of lost decades before he met me. And then it took the two of us and a lot of other very talented people about a decade to build Garden Fresh into what it would become, taken from a $4 million enterprise to essentially a $104 million enterprise. So it takes an awful lot of persistence. Um, and if you look at Garden Fresh as a whole, you know, here's two flunkies from Detroit um, trying to sell salsa. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? I mean, my, my first couple years with the company, I, I wasn't above, you know, getting sympathy sales. People would look at me like we were crazy. Um, so, you know, even that was not rational. So that's what I mean by irrational persistence. It is not rational to start your own business when the odds of failure are so high. And when you do, 
it, it, it literally can take decade or if, decades or if not more to get where you want to be. So your book is full of dozens of interesting lessons. There are a couple I want to focus in on. One is, is the metaphor of the dark room. So you say, being an entrepreneur is like walking into a dark room and figuring out where your source of light is. Tell us what you mean by the dark room. Sure. So let's say you have an idea for a business and imagine you're standing in front of a doorway and looking into a room that's completely dark, completely devoid of light. The rational person is going to, to walk away from that, again, because you know, just statistically you have a, such a high degree of failure. The entrepreneur will somehow be irrational enough or maybe have the courage to step into the room. And imagine the door closing behind you and you're in a dark room that's completely devoid of light. It's not fun, um, it's frightening, it's lonely to be in a dark room. So when you're in a dark room, what do you do? You start searching around for sources of light to illuminate your situation so that you can successively navigate the room. And if you are satisfied with where you are, that's great. If you want to grow your business, chances are there's going to be uh, in that room, you're going to find a, an even bigger door with an even bigger dark room beyond it. And if you, if you want to grow your business, it's not like it gets easier as it goes along. It can very often get more complicated. One of my favorite stories along these lines is um, Jack and I were getting garden fresh off the ground. We're doing pretty well in southeastern Michigan and the Midwest. And we decided that we wanted to get into Costco. Now, we knew nothing about Costco's business model, nothing about selling to them, nothing about being successful there. So we actually, our first meeting with Costco was in Los Angeles for their uh, Los Angeles regional buyer. And I swear to God, can't make this up. I'm in LA meeting with Paul Newman. He was our Costco Los Angeles deli buyer. A great guy, I feel indebted to him to this day. And we had just come out with our new branding and he's looking at a pint of our salsa and he says, this is, this is the best branding I've ever seen on a fresh salsa. And he tried it, he goes, this is the best fresh salsa I've ever had in my life. And he's looking at the label and he goes, you two are from Detroit? He goes, what did you do, get lost coming out of Texas? He goes, I get 100 fresh salsa companies in a year. They're all from either Texas or, or uh, Southern California. He goes, in Michigan, you're supposed to be making cars in Michigan. Whoever heard of salsa coming out of, of Detroit? So we get in the lobby afterwards, and my partner Jack was as unsettled as I've ever seen him. And he goes, Dave, I, you know, I know you want to swing for the fences here. I know you want to go try to take this national. Nobody wants salsa from Detroit. I go, well, Jack, that's where we're from. We can't walk away from who we are. <laughs> and he goes, I got an idea. And I go, what? He goes, we're going to get a post office box in New Mexico. And we're going to put that on our label, and we'll have all that. I go, Jack, that's not going to work. It was like the only serious disagreement we had for a couple <laughs> years. So uh, Paul Newman gave us a shot. We got into Costco. And before we knew it, within 18 to 20 months, we were chain-wide at Costco. They were easily our number one customer, and we were their top-selling fresh salsa chain-wide. Again, these two guys from Detroit. But a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. When you sell to a, a, a club format, you, you need to sell in a much larger volume. And we had to sell in a three-pound container, and we had so many fresh onions in our containers that those onions were fermenting. And when uh, onions ferment, they produce a gas. When you're in an airtight container, your product bloats like a kind of like a football. So at Costco, the problem became so grave, and I'd like to put it this way: when your product is exploding off the shelves, you know that means it's selling really well. That, that's that's good news. <laughs> When your product is exploding on the shelves, <laughs> I'm telling you, you've got a problem. And that's what was happening to us at Costco. This fermentation was so serious mm -hmm. in this three-pound container that literally the caps were blowing off our um, containers. So it was an existential problem. We had taken on a lot of debt to be able to gear up for this big new account we landed. And Jack found a company in Sweden that was producing these $2 million machines that subjected fresh food to uh, pressure in 43 degree water. And it's called high pressure pasteurization. And that allowed us to survive Costco's cold change management system. So again, being in a dark room, we were in a dark room when we first got the meeting with Paul Newman. We had no idea how to sell to Costco. No one else had any experience with it. Didn't know their business model, didn't know how to succeed there. When we did start succeeding there, we had this existential problem of not being able to control our fermentation. And it took a $2 million machine from Sweden, which we couldn't afford, by the way, to really solve this problem for us. So in the chapter on the dark room, you talk about changes in the grocery store that you had, you had observed. Uh, you talked about moving to the perimeter of the store. Tell us what that means and what, what it meant to, to Garden Fresh. Sure. So um, the uh, center of the store, which is like where Campbell's soup is sold and things of that nature, 
um, is uh, traditionally where uh, most sales occurred. There's been a food revolutionary revolution in this country in the past 20, 25 years, and I'm unbelievably proud of our country for where we come in terms of food. I really think we've caught up for you, with Europe for the most part. But uh, consumers now are gravitating toward what's known as the perimeter of the store. Fresh food, meat, seafood, deli, produce. Um, and that's kind of where the action is. And that is where Garden Fresh, we performed in the, in the center of the store with fresh food, fresh salsa, hummus, dips, guacamole, uh, tortilla chips, um, and that's kind of where, uh, that was the sandbox we played in. Nice. Um, and it, it really is on trend. You think of all the all natural, we were all natural, uh, farm to table, we were you know, making things by hand still, so it, it, it really worked for us. Great. So in, in your book, I, I've read your book, talked to you a few times, I know that you're a superb salesman. And yet in your book you say, in fact I think there's a whole chapter titled, Never Sell Anything. What do you mean by that, Dave? Well, to me, selling has a pejorative connotation, often deservedly so. If you're selling something to somebody, you're maybe acting in your best interest, but you may not be necessarily acting in the best interest of the person you're talking to. So to me, never selling anything is not so much for a sales force, it's for the people who are building companies. And our approach to building Garden Fresh was, uh, there's this, uh, I have a cute way of saying it, Woody Allen has this famous saying Bill, um, uh, that 80% of success in life is showing up. So I tell people, build a company that Woody Allen would be proud of. Uh, build a company where your sales force does not have to sell anything, they just have to show up to be successful. And what I mean by that is that you need to take a, a specific cognitive approach when you're building a company to layer in so many strategic advantages that your competitors can't possibly match that when your sales force shows up to meet with a buyer, they're not selling anything, they're literally having conversations. And those conversations are simply explaining the strategic advantages that your competitors can't match. So at Garden Fresh, we were the number one brand of fresh salsa. So only one brand can be number one, that was us. And I would tell a buyer, if you want the number one brand of the country, you can only get it from us. We had exclusive rights to the Margaritaville brand. Exclusive means exclusive. We were the only ones who could sell Margaritaville salsa. So if you wanted Margaritaville salsa, they can only get it from us. We were the only brand, uh, top 10 brand of fresh salsa that made our own tortilla chips. And tortilla chips are a perfect complement to salsa. Um, and we would do all kind of deals, uh, buy two salsas, get a, a free bag of chips. Nobody else could offer that. We were the third leading hummus manufacturer in the United States. We overtook Kraft. So if you wanted a great line of hummus from the person you were getting salsa and chips from, you can only get it from us. We had dips. Uh, we had this high pressure pasteurization. We were way ahead of the curve in technology. We would do private label for our customers. And by the time I laid all this out, I wasn't selling to them so much as they were buying from us. And not only were they buying from us, but they would look at our capabilities and they would say, could you do this for me? Can you do that for me? You know, I, I've been looking for this for a long time. I can't find anybody else to do it. You can do it. So we were forming strategic partnerships. So we, we built a company Woody Allen would be proud of. We layered in so many strategic advantages our competitors couldn't match. Our sales force, all they had to do was show up and have conversations and lay out our capabilities. I would never take data into a sales meeting. And as the number one brand in our category, nobody had better data than us. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a data-driven society and you know, businesses really focus on data, they should. But if you think about it, when you put data in front of a buyer, um, they know they're being manipulated. Nobody puts bad data in front of a buyer. Everybody you know, manipulates in some fashion to, to make it look appealing to the person they're talking to. And buyers know that. And especially in our category, in the deli, in the perimeter of the store, they still go by their gut. They still want to go by their instinct. It's a fun category to be in. So I never use data. I would just lay out these capabilities, mm -hmm. things I knew we could do that nobody else could. And again, they, I wasn't selling to them. They were buying from me. And then they'd come to me with other projects that only we could do. So what happened is that we would form strategic partnerships with them. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a situation where you're not selling to your customers, they're buying from you, and then they're reaching out to you for special projects to the extent that you're forming strategic partnerships, you're going to be in business for a thousand years. But again, it really comes down to how the approach you take to how you're building your company. If you're sending your sales force in there with a Me Too product where they've got to sell or win on the relationship, 
you're not doing them justice. You're not doing your you're, you're not doing your job as a leader of your company. You've got to take a specific approach to build that company. Woody Allen would be proud of, uh, and that's what we were able to do very successfully at Garden Fresh. Fantastic. I promised we'd come back to Campbell's Soup. I do want to get the insider's view on how you sold your company. 2015, you sell the company to Campbell's Soup for 231 million dollars. Tell us how that negotiation went, and if you would, if you can, I'm sure you can. Take some time and contrast the difference in culture between Campbell's and Garden Fresh. Well, great. Uh, how, how did it go? It went, it went very difficult. <laughs> it was very. It's a hard thing to do. Yep. Yep. Um, so, first of all, my uh, partner and his wife they did not want to sell. Um, we had been approached by many Fortune 500 companies, companies in the past. We did not have an exit strategy, which is not good for an entrepreneurial situation, but they just didn't want to sell. It took me a couple months to even get them to sell, and uh, what I feared was that we had taken the company as far as we could. And we were still a family company to many extent, uh, to a large extent. Mm -hmm. We'd never professionalized to the extent we probably should have. Um, in addition, I saw the competitive landscape getting much more challenging. And I didn't think we had the resources to compete with the Fortune 500 companies that were entering our field. So it took me a couple months to uh, convince my partner, Jack, who's one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life, and his, his, his wife and that, to sell. So then we entered into a, a negotiation with Campbell's. Um, I did not hire an investment banker. I, I did it myself. Um, and it's just a very difficult thing to go through. It, it's it's gut-wrenching. It takes a long time. I mean, from beginning to end, it probably it took nine months, um, and it's just a very complex world these days when you're selling. And um, so it was a very challenging process, but we, we got a multiple we were very happy with. It was about a 15.1 multiple, and um, um, you know it certainly worked out well for us. So you sell the company, and then what happens? It's 15 decades, lost decades, irrational persistence. Big exit. What what does Jack do then? Uh, what what do you and Jack do next? Yeah. Well, I, I wrote a book, which was uh, hardest thing I've ever done, but uh, very fulfilling. And um, uh, Jack actually set aside ten million dollars of his proceeds, and he started a uh, foundation. He calls it the Artichoke Garlic Foundation because that was the first variety of salsa he made in that five-gallon bucket in the back of that Bancorp restaurant just outside of Detroit. So he spent a lot of his time on philanthropy. And then he also founded, he was so um, uh, mesmerized by this high-pressure pasteurization, which mm -hmm. saved our business at, at Costco, that he has set up another company that is uh, producing something called a ready meal via high-pressure pasteurization. Mm -hmm. And we actually, I'm still involved in this to some extent, and we actually uh, shipped our first shipment to Costco uh, in Seattle a week ago Thursday, and I literally got word this morning how well they're selling. So. Great, great. And tell us about Fuel Leadership. So Fuel is a uh, digital media property that I founded uh, shortly after we sold to Garden Fresh. And what we do is, the, the best way to explain it is that, you know, we all get emails from GW and all our schools and everything. Uh, imagine if you got an email from your school that you, you actually wanted to open that was compelling, that was engaging, that maybe rewarded you in some way, shape, or form. Um, so we've been doing this in concert with the University of Michigan, who's been spectacular to us. And we've spent close to two years now developing a uh, digital publication that schools sent to their students and alumni via email. And it's got, uh, it's designed to inspire you. We have alumni videos saying what they're doing with their lives. Um, it's designed to inform you. There are campus events and things of that nature. It's designed to entertain you. Uh, it's actually very funny. There's some very, very en engaging material in there. It's meant to be read on your phone, three to five minute experience, so it's consistent with modern day life. Uh, schools benefit from it. There's a revenue stream for them, and there's a lot of ways that we can uh, reward our subscribers, who again are students and alumni. Um, I really think it's breakthrough stuff. I'm actually very proud of it. I don't know of anybody who's really looking at this space to the extent that we do. Mm -hmm. And we're doing beta testing literally a week from today at the University of Michigan. And we launch formally this fall. I wish you well with it. it, it Sounds like once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur, though. No, no relaxation. Well, it, it's time it's off? interesting because back to your original question: Are entrepreneurs born or made? Mm. I think they can be made. Yeah. But for me, I was I was literally uh, I, I just think it's the way I was. And what I think originally drew me to entrepreneurship again, I, I came from very humble beginnings, just outside of Detroit. Was you know I was living my life at a certain level, and I I saw what was possible out there, and I I, I saw the level at which I wanted to live my life. And that void uh, was just driving me crazy. I mean, that gap was just 
unacceptable to me mm. for some reason. So I would do whatever I had to do if it meant, you know, breaking 800,000 eggs or, or making 400,000 bottles of marinade in an unheated kitchen outside of Detroit. Uh, I was going to do it because I, I just I just needed to live the life that that I imagined for myself. Um, I think what keeps me going is I, I'm really drawn to, uh, I, I like to say there's an art and a science to business. And the science of business is very important, but I think it's very often commodified. I, I find myself drawn to the art of business. There's, there's a tremendous amount of creativity in business that I don't think people realize or, or give sufficient justice to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even call it making money. I don't even call it being profitable. I call it creating value. I mean, that's the approach I take to either building a company or running a business. You're literally creating value. And sometimes in, you know, in fuel, it may be bringing a community together or being in cash flow positive or in Garden Fresh. I mean, we were shipping a million units a week and we were quite profitable when mm -hmm. we sold. Um, but again, you're, you're creating value and it's focusing on the art that is in business. Um, which again, I don't think gets uh, sufficient attention because uh, there's tremendous artistry in business and I just find myself drawn to that uh, and it's just irresistible to me. Yeah, I think one of the things that comes through in your, your book is your focus on creating value for your customers, yeah. right? I mean, it's, you, you start your conversations even with, with us is, you know, what can I do that will be valuable to you? And yeah. I think that's the, if, if there's, there's no silver bullets, but that comes as close to it in entrepreneurship. Yeah, and one of the interesting things to me about running a company is that, uh, you know, there are all kinds of stakeholders. You have customers, you have employees, and you have owners, and they all want more mm -hmm. all the time. Customers want more value, and owners want more profit, and employees want more wages. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to want more. Um, but how you balance all that so that you can satisfy all levels of stakeholders to the greatest extent possible is a big part of being creative in business. Amen. I agreed. So, the word on the street is that Campbell's has put Garden Fresh up for sale. What, what did they do with it after, they, after you got it? And do you intend to buy it back? Well, it's uh, been a fascinating situation. When we sold to them, the last thing I ever expected them to do was not be successful. They were terrific people the ones who put the deal together, that right from the CEO um, on down quite a few levels. They were just terrific people. Um, they kind of ran into a perfect storm where a lot of people who put the deal together, for one reason or another, left the company. Mm -hmm. So the people who replaced them weren't as familiar with why, why they bought us in the first place. Um, then they, they did, uh, they kind of deactivated the brand. Uh, they abandoned our brand voice and our brand personality. To a large extent, they abandoned our approach to market. Um, and I think what they learned was that a Fortune 500 company just has a very difficult time executing work with a, a, a company our size. Mm -hmm. So um, they announced a portfolio review this May, and on uh, I think August 31st, uh, they revealed the results of that review and they decided to divest Garden Fresh. So um, they've turned it over to investment bankers, and we, my partner Jack and I, did put a bid on it on December 10th. We were asked to go to the second round. Uh, the next round of bids were literally due last Thursday. So um, you know, we'll see what happens. Well, well good luck. But there, good there are luck. a number of people bidding for it. I don't know if we'll get it back. Okay. All right. So we're we're coming close to the end of our time. Uh, I've got to ask you the uh, the you know the mandatory question. <laughs> Some, some kernels of advice for our, our young entrepreneurs, students in the audience, young alumni. What, what, uh, what advice would you give them? Uh? You know, uh, people ask me all the time, what's the biggest mistake I made? And the biggest mistake I made was this irrational decision to start a marinade company. Um, what I know now about marinades is that they're a lousy business to be in. Yeah. Uh, the market is completely saturated. Uh, the turn is very slow. More U.S. households use salad dressings as marinades than marinades and mar as marinades. Yeah. Uh, about the only business that's worse to be in is the mustard business, which was my, my <laughs> second, second one. Yeah, of course. Uh, mustard is unbelievably equally saturated, and the average U.S. household buys mustard two times a year. Um, so I refer to my lost decade. I would have had a lost century if I would have kept going down that path. But fortunately, I'm in New York, and I meet this six foot five, two hundred seventy five pound world champion softball player, no formal education, mm -hmm. no formal training, who of all things has got a fresh salsa, little fresh salsa company going back in Detroit. So it wasn't until I teamed up with him that I realized salsa, fresh salsa, was an emerging 
uh, market. It wasn't saturated. We had the best one on the market. The, the world was literally beating a path to our door. Um, so I kind of call it the holy grail of capitalism. Look for emerging markets that aren't yet saturated and build the absolute best product on, you can and the world will beat a path to your door. So my mistake was I didn't respect the characteristics of the markets that I initially entered, that being marinades and mustard. Mm -hmm. um, when we got to Garden Fresh though, it was a completely different story and we were off to the races. Fantastic. Well, that's a good note to end on, useful to our students and alumni. Dave, thank you very much for being here and taking time and sharing your thoughts. We really appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you. Thank you all. It, any other thoughts you want to share before we wrap up? I'm good if you're good. All right. I am good. I enjoyed it very much. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the audience who joined us in person and, and online. And I'd like to invite you to uh, attend the next session in the George Talks Business Series. Our next guest will be Dan Simons. Dan is the founder and co-owner of the Farmers Restaurant Group. He's also a GW School of Business alum. He'll be joining us on Monday, February 11th at noon. Look forward to seeing you then, either here in person or online, and thank you again for joining us.